Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, David Hurl, and uh, I have the pleasure this morning to introduce our speaker. But first, I'd like to uh, begin by just uh, thanking our sponsors this morning, which is so critical to make making the Minneapolis Hearns Two Foundation Grand Rounds a reality. For, from Actillion today, we have uh, Lacey uh, Kiefer and Jake Brown, and from Janssen Pharmaceuticals, Chuck Stark, Denise Birds, and Chelsea Wicksburg. So thanks very much for having them part of us this morning, and you can virtually participate in a conversation with them in the lobby for those of you who are here. Um, you know, I chair the Education Committee, and I'm with what I think are the greatest uh, group of rock stars uh, that make up the Education Committee for all the docs, but more, more importantly, the staff such as Maya, uh, John, who's our VJ, and, uh, and also uh, Jan Dick, who has done a wonderful job of, uh, of uh, taking over um, Rebecca's role. And uh, as I was thinking of the rock stars last night, I thought, you know, we're always trying to think of new ideas. And, and it's really amazing what's happened over the last five years with this particular conference and how we've evolved. And when we fell into the pandemic, I was thinking, oh, no, here it goes. We're done. Um, but, you know, actually, Shortly after the pandemic started, our numbers started to go up. And this year with the joining of the East Side, our numbers continue to go up. So every week now we have consistently, you know, pulling over a hundred people participating in this grand rounds. I said, well, what can we do for another idea? And then I thought, well, you know, I actually love baseball and I've kind of decided that I'm particularly into the twins regular season, not so much into the postseason. Uh, 18 games in a row is enough. And I thought, you know, the baseball players, when they kind of come up to give their speech, you know, bad, they have like their music. And uh, think about like Justin Morneau. So Justin Morneau gets up, what are you gonna hear? ACDC, every single time you hear ACDC, it's gonna be him. So I'm thinking last night, well, I don't know Brandon that well, um, but you know, maybe we could kind of start that thing. And I didn't talk to Jake about this. So I'm thinking, well, what's the right song for somebody like Brandon? So I was thinking, first of all, like the Beastie Boys. So we could do the Beastie Boys, the right to fight. That'd be an awesome song. I said, well, I know the lyrics maybe aren't quite right for this. So then I came upon uh, Metallica. So Sand, enter Sandman, enter Sandman. Like, uh, Maybe not, but then I finally hit it out of the park with uh, Death Lab. Let's get rock. So I looked at the lyrics and I said, this is perfect for Ben and Wiley. Do you want to get rock? Let's get rock. Let's get rock. I'm your average ordinary kid, happy to do nothing. In fact, that's what I did. I got a million ways to make my day, but daddy don't agree. Because when I try to get away, he says, he's got plans for me. Get your butt right out of bed. Stop bugging me. Get up and move your sleepy head. Don't shake me my tree. He said, mow the lawn. Who, me? Walk the dog? Not my style, man. Take out the trash? No way. Hide your room? Come on, get real. Sorry, Dad. Got to disappear. Let's get the rock out of here. <laughs> Today, we have Brandon Wyatt. What do we know about Brandon? Well, he... Uh, he serves currently as co-director of our cardiovascular intensive care unit and his training, you know, I was thinking about uh, like a lot of us goes all over the country. And I thought it'd be fun sometime for all the docs, nurses, mid-levels and that to just put dots on the map of everywhere they've been. And I'm sure we'd cover all, all 50 states and of course uh, around the world for many of our, of our staff. And Brent is no different. Started out in San Francisco where he did internal medicine at the University of California. Uh, from there, he decided to try the East Coast and went to Mount Sinai, uh, where there's some very well-known cardiovascular names, where he did his general cardiology and echocardiography, and finally went to the NIH, um, where he did his uh, intensive care work. Uh, Brandon's boarded in cardiovascular disease, critical care medicine, echocardiography. Um, he's co-authored 30 plus peer reviewed journal, a lot of them in echo and cardiovascular intensive care. He's exactly the kind of guy that we want a part of our group here at the foundation. Um, he served in the Society of Critical Medicine Ultrasound Committee and also an advisor reviewer of critical care medicine and Jack cardiovascular uh, imaging. Brandon came to us from the Mayo Clinic um, and we're uh, very happy to have him a part of us today. 
and uh, throughout our practice. He's really brought scientific rigor to our cardiovascular intensive care unit as we become used to having with our heart failure colleagues. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brandon, who's going to be giving a little bit different format this morning. He's going to give us the bulleted points of what we really need to know and hopefully get you out of here just a few minutes early. Brandon? Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much for that, that introduction. I'll, I'll try to live up to Def Leppard. <laughs> um, not a bad choice, actually, because uh, I am, I am of, that, of that vintage for sure. Uh, they asked me, and, and I want to do this, uh, sort of talk quickly, highlight one of the studies that we're starting. Um, this is a COVID study, the covid PAC study. Um, we've, uh, we're collaborating with the Timmy Group in Boston. And we're looking at anticoagulation and antiplatelet therapy in critically ill COVID patients. I think this is a really important trial uh, just for everyone to have on their radar. Uh, both Alex and I will be, uh, will be the cardiovascular uh, side of that. Um, and we're gonna try and answer the question of what to do with antiplatelet therapy and, and uh, anticoagulation therapy in COVID patients. Um, and we've seen, I think all of us have seen uh, complications uh, both uh, myocardial infarctions and DVTs in these patients. So I think this will be a really good trial. So moving forward here, my talk today, and I'd like to thank uh, the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation and the, uh, the committee for Grand Rounds for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm going to talk a little bit about point of care ultrasound and applications for the cardiologist. Um, I have nothing to disclose. And the objective for this talk um, is fairly straightforward. What I'm going to do is talk about point of care ultrasound sort of in a global way. And then from that, I'm going to pull out lung ultrasound, one of the techniques of point of care ultrasound, and talk about how we can use that in the diagnosis of shortness of breath and in prognosis and heart failure. And finally, we're going to take lung ultrasound and we're going to look at how we can use it in a novel way for the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease. Under objectives, I put career roadmap because this is sort of what I've done. Uh, during my career. I trained uh, in cardiology first in echo, but then went to critical care and actually learned point of care ultrasound during my critical care time and lung ultrasound during that period of time. When I came back into cardiology uh, at Mayo Clinic, uh, I started to look at how we can use lung ultrasound uh, in the cardiovascular department and in the uh, division of, of ultrasound, and then looked at how we could apply it in some novel ways uh, in the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease. So that's what we'll talk about. So let's start with the case. It's, I think, always fun to start with the case. And this is a patient that I took uh, care of at my prior institution, a 55-year-old male. He presented to the cardiovascular ICU after an out-of-hospital VT uh, VF arrest, was found to have an inferior STEMI. He underwent successful PCI uh, to the CERC and RCA, but it was a long case. He had multiple VFib arrests during the case. The Lucas was on. He was getting a CPR. And then he, when he finally showed up to the cardiovascular ICU, he was in... Uh, uh, shock on multiple pressors, but also interestingly, he was uh, profoundly hypoxic with really high peak and plateau pressures on the ventilator, and on 100% FiO2 was only satting uh, 80%. So he came right at change of shift. I was a night person coming on, and the daytime person uh, got an echocardiogram, and I was just standing over the shoulder of the uh, sonographer as they were as they were imaging. And what we see here are the findings of an RV infarct. We see a, a dilated hypokinetic RV, an underfilled uh, LV. And so definitely that could be driving the uh, shock that we're seeing. But what about that refractory hypoxia? I'm not sure that that was totally explained by that. So I did a quick lung ultrasound and within 30 seconds of placing the probe on the right side of the chest, we were able to activate multi, uh, a massive transfusion protocol, get the level one going and get some blood products going because what we saw was this heterogeneous, well-circumscribed ma mass in the, the right lung field. And what that was, was an intrapleural hematoma due to a rib fracture caused by CPR. And the point of this case is just to highlight how the use of ultrasound at the bedside, looking outside of the heart and incorporating uh, the interrogation of multiple organ systems can help us make a rapid diagnosis and start therapies at the bedside. And in that sense, point of care ultrasound is a, a really important part of our practice. And we have to think about it as something outside of echo. It's an ultrasound exam that is performed and interpreted by the practitioner at the bedside. That's different than echo classically, which is performed by a sonographer and interpreted by us cardiologists remotely. 
Why is point of care ultrasound important? Well, it's important because the traditional clinical exam is difficult. And I could have, uh, I don't know, a thousand papers up here, all fairly old, because when we've looked at the clini clinical exam, it really was, uh, you know, maybe 15 or, or 20 years ago. But we're just not that good at doing it, e even cardiologists. And I think, you know, an interesting study was uh, the one of 442 consecutive patients admitted to an academic medical center, where only 40% of them were diagnosed appropriately by history and physical. So what does point of care ultrasound allow us to do? Well, it allows us to improve our clinical exam. And there are also, I mean, the, the data here is growing every day. And it can be as ridiculous as students with point of care ultrasound do a better job than cardiologists at diagnosing a murmur. But I think, you know, for me in my practice, it's as important as a large study of over a thousand cases where point of care ultrasound changed the diagnosis in a quarter of them and importantly changed the management in almost 50%. And this conflict between uh, point of care ultrasound and the physical exam played out during my training. Uh, I, as, as was said, I, I trained at, at Mount Sinai with, with Dr. Fuster, and really he was a mentor for me. And when I got there, um, I was just blown away by his command of the physical exam. I mean, he is truly a master. And what we used to do, and, and during my, my time as the chief uh, fellow, we had to find cases for him during the week, and he would do a physical exam Thursday, which was called Fooster Rounds, where he would just examine a patient and tell us what the patient had as their pathology. And I wanted to be like him. I really did. But I felt like he was using something. He had this sort of sixth sense, this ability to like understand the force in a way that I couldn't. And I was just never going to be as good as him at the physical exam. And during the same period of time, I was starting to learn echocardiography and, and was really trying to get very good at scanning myself and using it so that I could look at what the etiology of the murmur was or under some, understand something about the, the hemodynamics. And we actually did a grand rounds together. And it was a great grand rounds where we talked about how the physical exam has sort of changed in the modern era as we've started to have some uh, handheld devices. And so after that grand rounds, when he was taking over Jack, he asked me to, to write an editorial with him where we talked about what was happening uh, to the bedside exam in cardiology. And my initial, uh, uh, my initial paper that I sent him uh, was entitled Death of the Stethoscope and the Evolution of the, uh, the Bedside Cardiac Exam. And I think he felt that I had turned to the dark side at that point. Uh, and, and I can say that because when this was actually finally published and it was, he sort of changed things around and decided that he wanted to have the fellows publish an editorial every, every, in every Jack episode, so it was going to be the first editorial. He actually changed the title to the handheld, handheld ultrasound and the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease at the bedside. So there was this real conflict between the traditional stethoscope and how we examine patients and kind of where we're going in medicine. And when I take a step back, you know, maybe... I was overplaying the sort of death of the stethoscope thing. And really, you know, more importantly, it's not really the death of the stethoscope, but it's truly the evolution of what we think the bedside is in medicine and how things are changing. And, and point of care ultrasound really is better incorporated into that, into the management of patients and understanding what happens. So just globally, the way I think about point of care ultrasound is I like to refer to it as a holistic bedside exam. And holistic, meaning that it's, uh, it's comprehensive. I look at different organ systems in the same way that you would examine a patient using the physical exam, but I use ultrasound to do it. So for example, in a patient that comes with hypoxia, I, you could do a compression ultrasound to look for a DVT. You could do a lung ultrasound that shows dry lung fields. And you could do a quick cardiac look that shows a dilated RV and just make that diagnosis of a PE at the bedside. To explain a little bit more about how I think about this comprehensive uh, bedside examination with ultrasound, in the cardiac ultrasound, I look at biventricular function, I look at valvular disease, I do some simple Doppler hemodynamics, and I look at the pericardium. For a lung ultrasound, I, I break it down. I look at the pleura, the parenchyma, and the pleural space. In a vascular ultrasound, of course, the IVC is part of that, but the aorta and the compression venous ultrasound is important. And then finally, with the abdominal ultrasound, you learn how to do a fast exam to look for free fluid. You can do a renal ultrasound to look for hydronephrosis. And you can even start looking at the liver uh, 
to look to get a better feel for what the CVP is by looking at the portal van. And so a, a more comprehensive exam, uh, it, an example of that would be this patient who was uh, in hospital cardiac arrest uh, and came to the unit with hypotension, had a lot of CPR that was done, again with the Lucas, maybe a little bit mispositioned. And there was a positive FAST exam. We see fluid here around the liver. The IVC is, of course, collapsing. So the CVP is low. There's a, if not normal, maybe a hyperdynamic LV. And then the lung ultrasound shows sliding. So the lung is up and there are B lines. There's no pneumothorax. So this person is hypotensive from an intra-abdominal hemorrhage. And they actually had a lacerated hepatic artery that was from that, that mispositioned uh, lucus. And you can see the, the blood here. And of course, this is important to do because the patient was too unstable to send to the scanner at the time. So to be able to make the diagnosis at the bedside and get things going is really important. So again, this holistic idea, if we just want to break it down and be simple, the idea is just not to be cardiac centric, it's to look outside of the heart when we ultrasound people. And we can even just take pieces of this comprehensive exam. And we can see how just the cardiac part can lead us astray sometimes. So this was a 59 year old female who had an ICD placed and then when she was in the uh, recovery area, developed shock. And initially, the team that saw her said that she was in cardiogenic shock. It makes sense from looking at these images. We see that um, she's got a profound cardiomyopathy. Her EF is quite low. Her IVC is dilated. So a dilated IVC in someone with shock with a low EF, you would think, okay, well, they're high CVP, high, high cardiac filling pressures. It's a low EF situation and a, and a low cardiac output situation. But when you add lung ultrasound to it, you pick up the fact that there is a heterogeneous fluid collection right around, right above the diaphragm on the, the left side. And so this person is bleeding. And not only are they bleeding, but they've caused a tension hemothorax that's, that is leading to that dilated IVC. This is obstructive shock. And then, you know, it's funny with echo, sometimes we are incredibly cardiac centric and cardiac focus, which we should be when we look at an echocardiogram. But if you, if you take a step back, uh, you come up with a different diagnosis. So this was a patient who presented, was, a, was tachycardic and not terribly hypotensive at the time, but got an echocardiogram in the ED. She was awake and it was read by the, uh, by the echo person as severe hypertrophy of the left ventricle um, uh, at, and basically as, uh, as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. If we do a little bit more, which the sonographer did, which I thought was really neat because we were starting to teach the sonographers how to do lung ultrasound, but kind of difficult to see here with these images, but there's lung sliding and there's no beeline. So these are dry lung fields. There's, there's no extra fluid on board. And then that, although it's not working there, the IVC is, is very collapsed. And so it's not truly uh, severe hypertrophy of the, of the ventricle, but it's pseudo hypertrophy of the left ventricle from profound hypotension, uh, from pro profound hypovolemia leading to the hypotension. And what's cool about this case is that, you know, we re-imaged the person after they were resuscitated. And you can see how the LV has changed when they actually have their ac actual preload on board. And what sort of sets the whole thing off here is that the, the RV is, is really underfilled when they came in. So that's a sign that the, the, the CVP was quite low. But again, sort of thinking outside of just the picture of only looking at the heart and why it's important in critical care. So we've gone over a little bit about point of care ultrasound and sort of my idea of the holistic uh, bedside exam. Now let's pull out lung ultrasound because I think that it's something that we can really use in the setting of, of cardiovascular disease and when we take care of patients. So the components of lung ultrasound, I mean, you can look at the whole lung. You can look at the pleura, the parenchyma, and the diaphragm, and what you can diagnose is almost everything. What I tend to focus on in cardiovascular disease is pulmonary edema, volume status, and wedge pressure. But also now with uh, COVID, we think a lot about ARDS and pneumonia. How we do lung ultrasound? Well, this is a very basic slide, and if anyone is, is interested, I'm happy to, to, to show you or even give you some more data. But you can scan in two different ways. One is a, uh, a uh, transverse way where you are perpendicular to the ribs and looking in the intercostal space here. What you see is the pleural line and then two rib shadows. And then if you rotate the probe, 
into an oblique orientation where you're between the ribs, the pleural line will be elongated across the region of interest there. So really we're just looking at the lung in the intercostal space and the only thing we can really truly see is the pleural line. Everything pa past the pleura uh, is artifact because ultrasound is attenuated by, by dry lung. And so this is a normal scan. What we see here is the pleural line right here, and there's motion there. If you watch it, there's a little bit of motion. And that's the two layers of the pleura, the parietal and visceral pleura, sliding up against each other. That tells us that the lung is up. And then past the pleura here, this is the lung, but this is all artifact because ultrasound is attenuated in that, in that uh, air, air uh, laden space. And so when we do a lung ultrasound, I just break it down into assessing the three components of the lung. The first thing I look at is the pleural line and I make sure that there's normal lung sliding because if there isn't lung sliding or if the pleural line is irregular, then there's pathology. Then I look at the parenchyma and I try to decide whether or not there is increased density in the lung. And then finally, I look at the pleural space. So with the pleural line, we've sort of looked at already, but what we're looking for again is that motion here of the, of the uh, pleural line. And you can see it kind of up here. This is in the um, transverse view. So these are two rib shadows there. And then with a normal dry aerated lung, that pleural line is reverberated in the far field and we have A-lines. Those A-lines are again um, just reverberations here of that pleural line. And when you have A-lines and pleural sliding, you have dry aerated lung. It's normal lung. If you don't have pleural sliding and you don't have B-lines, well then you have a pneumothorax. And so what you can see here, there's the pleural line, but there's no sliding there. The only thing that's happening here is motion of my hand um, because the patient wasn't doing so well. Um, but here you see that on the other side of the, the patient's chest, there is some sliding there. So this person had a pneumothorax. We use this uh, all the time in cardiac surgery and post-cardiac surgical patients when we're looking for pneumothoraces after they pull chest tubes. This is a quick and easy way to do it without getting a chest x-ray. Um, and we'll talk about how sensitive and specific it is for, the, for that finding. And then this has become really important in, uh, in COVID but is looking at the actual um, uh, morphology of the pleural line. So here's a very nice thin pleural line. This is normal. But if you look here, there are these little uh, areas, uh, little nodules that have formed here. The pleural line looks irregular, right? So that's, that's a subpleural consolidations. That you see that in fibrotic lung disease or in pneumonia. And this is what you see in patients with COVID. So we've talked about the pleural line. Let's talk about the parenchyma now. The parenchyma is a very simple exam. What we're looking for is evidence of increased lung density. So a normal lung is a, is a very light, uh, sponge-like uh, uh, organ. But when it becomes dense with fluid, for example, um, you begin to see a pattern emerge with ultrasound. And that pattern uh, is an interstitial process. And that interstitial process is defined by the presence of B-lines. The, these are these linear, uh, linear vertical, white um, uh, kind of like spotlights that resonate from the pleural line here. When you see B lines more than, than three in one intercostal space, that's an interstitial pattern. And that's telling you that that area of the lung is dense. And that lung density either comes from fluid inflammation or fibrosis. That's your, that's your differential right there. And when you start to see this uh, density spread out bilaterally in the lungs, it tells you something about the process that's going on. Why do we see B lines? We don't know. And uh, one of the thoughts is that in a normal lung, the interlobular septa is very thin. And of course, this is all aerated. So uh, the ultrasound uh, waves are attenuated there and you get these A lines, which are just reverberations of the pleural line. But when they're, the uh, interlobular septa is thickened, for example, when there's a lot of fluid, you get, um, you get reverberation here, more and more uh, reverberation from the, from the ultrasound. And this bouncing of the beams creates these, uh, they're called comet tail artifacts. But in, in lung ultrasound, we call them B lines. So again, increased lung density leads to these B lines. 
And just to show you the difference in the two, here's a beeline pattern again with these vertical uh, white uh, spotlights coming from the intercostal space here. Here's a pleural line. And here's a dry aerated lung. We see this nice little A line here, which is the reverberation artifact of the pleural line here. And what does this look like uh, with a CT scan? Well, here's a dry lung. We see a normal CT scan. And here is uh, a patient with uh, fluid. We see a, a septal thickening here. We can actually see the interlobular septa here thickened. And this is the, uh, the ultrasound from this patient. So again, there's nice correlation there with uh, two different imaging modalities. And why are B-lines important in cardiovascular disease? Well, it's been well shown that the more fluid you have in the lungs, the more B-lines you get. So as you go from dry lungs where there, where there are no B-lines, just A-lines, and you increase to very wet lungs, you increase the number of B-lines you see until there's so many B-lines that the entire lung itself just looks white. It becomes confluent. And the reverse is also... Um, the reverse also happens here, and this is what's really nice in heart failure patients, is that as you diurese patients and remove fluid from the lungs, the number of B-lines reduce. And so this was a, a nice study um, uh, by, from Vicki Noble, uh, where she just looked at dialysis patients pre and post, and as they were dialyzed, the number of B-lines changed markedly. And so I repeated this um, during my time at Mayo in, in heart failure patients, and sort of did it in a different way to sort of prove a point. But we, had, we looked at patients admitted in heart failure, and we combined lung ultrasound with uh, lung ultrasound surface wave elastography. And so what elastography is, is, it looks at the surface speed of ultrasound waves. And what we saw is that as we diaries patients, as they lost about two kilos of volume over the course of 24 hours, the number of B lines went down but also the, the shear wave uh, velocity went down on the lungs, right? And so what that means is that the lungs became softer. They became more compliant, which everything there tended to make sense. So we removed patients from the fluid. The fluid came from the lungs. There were less beelines. The lungs were less congested, less dense. And with that, they were softer. They were more compliant. So it was just sort of proving a concept there. And if we move away from B lines and we think about the other finding we can have with the parenchyma of the lung, we can talk about consolidation. And again, we're seeing a lot of this with COVID. But here is a consolidated lung here. And what we see is we can actually start to see the lung when it becomes consolidated. It begins to look like an organ. And the term is hepatization of the lung because it begins to look a bit like the liver. So we've talked about assessing the parenchyma. Finally, let's talk just briefly about assessing the plural space. Normal, you shouldn't see anything in the pleural space, right? When it's abnormal, you see fluid. And usually with fluid, there's also uh, 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 atelectatic or compressed or consolidated lung. So this is just uh, some fluid here, uh, just above the diaphragm. So what does this look like in practice? Well, this was a patient that was transferred emergently to the ICU. She had come in with endocarditis of the mitral valve, and then all of a sudden became more profoundly short of breath and her mitral valve, I mean, uh, sort of disintegrated. And what we see here is anywhere where we put the probe on the chest, there are beelines everywhere. So this patient has profound pulmonary edema from that uh, mitral regurgitation. And then if we wanna get really cute, we can pick on the fellows. And this was a patient um, who the ED called and said, look, this guy is on BiPAP, he's got a low EF, um, he's a heart failure admission. Because of BiPAP, he's got to go to the unit. And I said, okay, well, I'll send the fellow down to take a look at stuff. And the fellow went down and said, yeah, patients in heart failure need to come up. And I said, okay. So the patient came up, and then just for um, educational purposes, we did a lung ultrasound. And what we see here is on the uh, left side of the chest, you can see the, the plural line here, but you don't see any beelines at all. And on the right side of the chest, there's no B-lines in the, in the apical areas here. But as you start to move down, you see some B-lines there. And then this area right here, this is where I got that picture of consolidation from. So, you know, this is the fellow admitting a patient with a pneumonia uh, to the uh, CCU, which is sort of a faux pas. Um, but a nice way for us to look at that sort of focal B-line pattern, right? So there is dense lung, but it's really isolated to an area. It's not diffuse. And when it's not diffuse, it's not going to be cardiogenic pulmonary edema. 
So let's kind of put this together and talk about how we can use lung ultrasound for the diagnosis of shortness of breath. And this is something that we do all the time in the hospital as cardiologists. So we talked about that beeline pattern and what that means. It means there's increased lung density and decreased aeration. And that can be caused due to two things, either fibrosis, so intrinsic disease in the lung itself, or interstitial edema. And that edema can either be inflammatory or non-inflammatory. We're really more concerned about non-inflammatory edema or cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So that's our differential. And the way I look at patients or I, um, I examine them with, uh, with ultrasound to determine whether or not their shortness of breath is from cardiogenic pulmonary edema is I just divide the chest up into two halves and I look at four zones on each side of the chest. And then I look quickly above the diaphragm bilaterally to see if there are effusions. If I see beelines on both sides of the chest, so bilateral beeline pattern, right? So this is a diffuse pattern. And it looks very homogeneous in nature. And the pleural line is normal. So there's no inflammation that, that's making the pleural line look abnormal or, or irregular. Then that's cardiogenic pulmonary edema. If I only see beelines on one side of the chest, that's a focal process. That is not cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There's something else going on there. And it's either pneumonia, atelectasis, an infarct, something like that. And so how does this look? Well, here's your 50-year-old with shortness of breath, ischemic cardiomyopathy, EF of 40%. You just apply the probe across the chest. And if you see beelines everywhere, maybe no beelines right here because this is right over the heart. It's tough to kind of see things but beelines everywhere else in tiny little effusions, that patient has a bilateral ultrasound interstitial syndrome. That is cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That patient gets Lasix. But in the same patient, if they only have beelines isolated to one side of the chest and everything else is dry, just A-lines, and maybe a little bit of an effusion in that area like we saw before, but no effusion on the other side, that is a focal process. That's not cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That's going to medicine. That is not our problem. Just kind of kidding. Kind of our problem. It's going to be our problem eventually. So how good is, is, is lung ultrasound for diagnosing cardiogenic pulmonary edema? It's really good. So this is a study of 1,000 patients. Uh, this was done in Italy. And all they looked at, actually, they were really simple. They just looked at three spots on each side of the chest, so a six-zone exam. And it's just sort of going... Uh, anterior to just slightly lateral, and they're looking for three or more beelines. And if they have three or more beelines on both sides of the chest, that's cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That's how they defined it. And you can see that lung ultrasound here is better than the clinical exam. And if you add the two together, you're really good at diagnosing the etiology of, of shortness of breath and determining whether or not it's cardiogenic versus non-cardiogenic. What I think is really important here and what I'm going to harp on is the chest x-ray is incredibly insensitive. And this is important. The chest x-ray is something that we so hold on to in cardiology. We, we do this all the time where we, we get a chest x-ray to decide if we want to continue to diurese the patient who comes in heart failure, or if we think that they're a little volume overloaded. You know, a large meta-analysis, uh, multiple meta-analysis have shown us that chest x-rays compared to lung ultrasound are just incredibly insensitive. So if we're using chest x-rays, serial chest x-rays to diagnose a patient, we are doing them a disservice. We should just be scanning them at the bedside and determining whether or not they need to be diuresed. For a pneumothorax, this is the same sort of thing. We do this a lot in, uh, C with CT surgery. We get a chest x-ray after we pull the chest tubes. Again, not terribly sensitive. It's very specific. If the pneumothorax is there, it is there. But we miss it a lot of the time. Again, just scan the patient with an ultrasound. Get good at that. You don't have to get a chest x-ray. It's cheaper and easier and faster. And the data supports it. How do we incorporate lung ultrasound into heart failure patients that we see in clinic? We can perform lung ultrasound on them. And with this study uh, out of this group at uh, uh, Brigham and Women's with, who have done a lot of work in lung ultrasound and heart failure, we see that as the number of beelines increase in ambulatory patients, there is more all-cause mortality and hospitalization in those patients, right? So that's a prognostic thing. These patients are not going to do well. And it's because they're walking around with subclinical pulmonary edema. And what's, I think, really interesting here is that you don't hear Rawls in these patients. The majority of these patients, you can't hear anything, but you can see the edema because lung ultrasound is just more sensitive. 
And this has been repeated by the same group in patients who are hospitalized with acute decompensated heart failure. And they just looked at four zones, right? They just looked at two zones, uh, two intercostal spaces on both sides of the chest. And it's very feasible. So 97% of the patients, they could get a good lung ultrasound in. And 35% of the patients had no RALS. 11% had relatively, had clear chest, they were red as clear chest x-rays. But these are patients with a high BNP, who have B lines on exam, who have low EFs. And what we see is there is no difference in the EF or the comorbidity in these groups of patients. And they were divided into tertiles based on the number of B lines. And those patients with the most B lines over the course of when they are discharged, so this is, these are patients who had, a, who had a lung exam at the time of discharge. If they still have B lines on their lung exam when they are discharged, they are much more likely to either die or be rehospitalized within 60 days, 90 days, 180 days. So we are, we are discharging these people when they are still congested. They're going to come back. And when you look at these patients just based on their first lung ultrasound when they come in, and they looked at a composite endpoint of how long they were going to be in the hospital, do they die in the hospital, do they need to go to the ICU, do they get an LVAD? Obviously, it's a very small numbers here. Do they need an inotrope? But if you do a composite endpoint of all these things, so do patients do worse when they come into the hospital? If they have more B lines when they come in the hospital, they do worse. So you can actually st risk stratify patients based on your exam just with, a, with an ultrasound probe. And then when you discharge them, if they still have B lines there, they're going to do worse. And this has been borne out in multiple studies, both in acute heart failure and chronic heart failure. The more B lines you have, the worse you do. So it's a really nice and easy way of examining patients and sort of risk stratifying them. And this is not something you can do with the physical exam because it's just the physical exam is not sensitive enough to pick this up. These are patients with subclinical pulmonary edema. And so we started incorporating this into the, um, the uh, echo reads at Mayo. So for example, this was a patient who was sent to the echo lab with an indication of possible CHF. They were an outpatient. They were actually visiting from Missouri, I think. And anyways, they had severe mitral regurgitation. And importantly, the sonographer did a lung ultrasound, he identified the fact that there was a severe MR and looked for congestion. And we, the patient was full of B lines. And so the point of that is to let the team know, let the referring person know that this patient is walking around in heart failure. And this patient should be admitted. And if we wait until they develop Rawls and weight gain, significant weight gain, then they're actually sicker, right? They're going to come in with more B lines, and we know that those patients do worse. So it's a way for us to pick up these patients in the outpatient setting. So the last five minutes of the talk here, we're going to talk about how we can incorporate lung ultrasound into some novel applications for the evaluation of cardiovascular disease. So when I was at Mayo, I worked with, um, with uh, Barry Borlaug, and we looked at using lung ultrasound in patients with HEFPEF. So Barry does invasive... Um, uh, cardiovascular uh, stress tests. So he puts catheters into the patient uh, in the cath lab. They ride a, a bike when they're, sit, when they're laying on the uh, cath table, and he looks at how the filling pressures change. And so we thought, well, this would be really interesting. Let's see if these, some of these patients develop B lines. Do they develop what, what's called extravascular lung water? Do they move fluid into the extravascular space in the lungs? And what he found was in 61 patients that are all being sent, this is for workup of chronic dyspnea uh, to see if they have HEFPEF, 50% of those patients develop B lines or extravascular lung water. And what was most interesting here is that the patients that developed lung water when they exercised, there was no difference in their EFs, right? These are all patients with normal EFs who are short of breath. But what was most interesting is that the patients that developed lung water had resting RV dysfunction. So their RVs were not normal. And then as they exercised, we can see that their wedge pressure started at a higher place and went up more. And their right atrial pressure started at a higher place and went up more. So not only did they have RV dysfunction, but they had higher right-sided pressures, and then they had higher wedge pressures with exercise. And we looked at, when we looked at markers of RV-PA coupling, so that is to say that as the PA pressure goes up, the RV should improve in its function. And if it doesn't, if it actually worsens in its function, then you have discoupling of the RV and PA. And that's what we saw in patients that developed lung water. 
that their, that their RV uh, PA uh, coupling be, was not normal. They uncoupled. And then the other thing we saw was that there was hemoconcentration in those patients that developed lung water. So it's another, it's more proof that they're losing fluid into the extravascular space. They're actually hemoconcentrating. So we were able to really look at the, uh, what was going on here. And the, the theory that we came, that came out of this was that there was really a two hit um, uh, process here. One was that these patients had left-sided heart failure, right? They had HEFPEF. And when they exercised, they had increases in their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and that left, led to more fluid leaving the ex, in, intravascular space and becoming extravascular in the lungs. And at the same time, they had RV dysfunction, and they had high right-sided pressures. And what happens in the lungs is that fluid should be moved into the, into the lymphatic system and drained into the right side of the heart. Well, that can't happen when the right atrial pressure is high. So not only are they pushing fluid out into the lungs, but they're not draining it normally. And when you have those two processes going on, they develop significant lung water. So we said, okay, well, this is really interesting. This is cool. So, well, let's look at patients who we exercise in the, in the echo lab. So this is a real case, uh, the case that, that I actually did myself. But so this is a patient who developed anterior wall motion abnormality with exercise, right? We see the anterior wall goes down. And what we did was a lung ultrasound before and after they exercised. And what we saw in a really kind of interesting way was that with that lung ultrasound, if it plays, I hope it plays, the patient developed B lines. So they became ischemic and they beat out, right? They had B lines everywhere. And at the same time, we did filling pressures in these patients because we always did a diastolic uh, evaluation before and after. And before the patient exercised, he had normal filling pressures with an E over E prime of, of 8.6. And after exercise, he became ischemic, developed B lines, and his filling pressures went up on the left side. So he developed high left atrial pressure. That led to sudden dynamic pulmonary edema, patient with short of breath. So that was a really cool study. And we were trying to build a, 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 a large database uh, with those patients, but we got scooped by the Italians. And they just came out with this paper, um, I think it's like uh, two months ago but really a, an, an amazing study of 2,000 patients. And it's basically what I just explained there. They did a four zone exam uh, at the lungs and they just looked at the lungs before and after stress in 2,000 patients. And the take home point here, just the only thing to take home is, one, it's very feasible. I don't know if I believe 100%. No offense to the Italian groups, but nothing's 100%. But, but what they saw is the more B lines that you develop when you exercise, whether or not you have a normal EF or an abnormal EF, the worse you do. And the mortality goes up across the, the, uh, the they used uh, turtiles here, but no B lines, mild, moderate, severe. It goes up across the board. And you get to the point where MI and death is quite high. If you have a lot of B lines, you develop a lot of B lines with exercise, you are not gonna do well. So it actually changes stress testing, right? Because when we, when we do a stress test and the stress test is, is, is normal or abnormal, what we're doing is we're trying to think about the person's risk for having an event in the next 12 months, for example. And what this does is it changes the way we actually think about that risk. We can re-stratify people and make them higher risk or lower risk for that matter, because some of these people, they didn't have any B lines at all when they exercised. And so finally, I'll end with this. This was um, a case series we put together for Jack. The other place I thought that this would be really interesting in looking at lung ultrasound was in patients with valvular disease. And a lot of times, not a lot of times, what we like to do is send patients who we're not terribly sure if they have severe valvular disease or not to the, to the stress lab, because we wanna see when we exercise them, do they, does the, uh, do they, do, are we able to bring out the severity of the valve disease? So this is a patient, for example, um, who had a mean gradient. It's kind of overtraced here, but if you overtrace it, it's around five. She's got rheumatic disease. She's got really at most mild mitral regurgitation. She's got a little bit of mild AI and she's got a resting TR velocity that gives her an, R, um, uh, an RVSP of around 29. She had kind of nonspecific symptoms. So we stressed her, we exercised her and we want to see what happened to the, to, the, uh, to the hemodynamics. And what we did is we did a lung ultrasound beforehand and lung ultrasound shows nothing, right? So she has dry lungs when she starts exercising. There are no B lines there at all. 
And then we exercise her, the gradient across the mitral valve goes, goes up significantly to 20, 22. As typical, I mean, it's hard to get the, the gradients here. The heart's moving. This patient's on a bike, but it's difficult to do. So the sonographer, I think, is being optimistic here at making some measurements about what the TR velocity is. But let's say it's somewhere between this is around 40, maybe higher, kind of unclear. And so what does the lung ultrasound show us? Well, uh, in kind of a remarkable way, the person develops beelines everywhere, right? So what it shows us is that mitral valve disease is really significant, and that shortness of breath the patient develops is because that left atrial pressure spiked as they exercised, as that gradient of the mitral valve went up. And so what we took from that is that there's increased left atrial pressure, that there's dynamic pulmonary edema that develops, and these are very objective findings that that valve is diseased, and this patient is short of breath from the valve. And there's a lot of different ways that you can apply this, this in, in the setting of valvular disease. So I'm going to stop there and sort of summarize my talk. I talked a little bit about point of care ultrasound just in a global way. And then how you can take pieces of it. And what I took from it was lung ultrasound and how we can use it in cardiovascular disease. Not only for diagnosing the etiology of shortness of breath, but also to understand something about fluid status and then apply it in a prognostic way in patients. And then finally, we can start to use it in a novel way when we evaluate patients uh, with cardiovascular disease. We can start to think about changes in filling pressure. Um, we can look at prognosis with stress echo. Uh, but it's a whole new way, I think, of, of looking at how we do things in cardiology using ultrasound and something that we all can embrace. So I'll stop there. All right, any questions? Yeah. yeah. So um, great, great talk. And I think we all enjoy using new technology or existing technology to take better care of patients. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the hardware side of things? What, what's out there? What do you think works best? That's yeah, that's a great question because it's changing. Uh, like everything, every, you know, there's an iPhone every like year. It's kind of the same thing with ultrasound at this point. When I started using this uh, at Mount Sinai, there would, they just come out with the V-Scan, the GE device, which is, um, which is fine. Um, and so the, the, there are V-Scans. The V-Scans are, are, are not bad. They actually have ones that have um, probes that have a, uh, a phased array and a linear on the same probe. So you can just rotate the probe and change it and you can do uh, you can use a linear um, uh, for like uh, vascular stuff, and you can use the phased array for, for cardiac stuff or lung stuff. Um, there are, and then there are tons of other machines. There's a, uh, Sonocyte has, has a machine. Um, there's a new thing called the, the Cosmos that we have a couple of in the, the CCU, where it, it is uh, one probe and you can do linear, you can do phased, you can do Doppler with it. So we're getting to the point now where there's a lot of technology and you can plug it into your phone or they have little handheld um, tablets that you can use. What I've done mostly uh, myself is, um, is just use the echo machine when it comes up and try and show the sonographer how to do it. But everything that I do, I just use a phased array probe. I think that's the key, no matter what technology is you use, but I try to use one probe for everything. And in the same way that you would just use a stethoscope as your exam tool, I use the phased array probe for everything that I do. Brennan, excellent talk. And uh, thanks for your expertise. I learned quite a lot. Um, you know, I've been using the butterfly, which is you know, uh, mostly for cardiac, but now I'm gonna try to admit it to the lungs. Uh, talk about, please, the, you know, we would try to do back in Pittsburgh, this E over E prime with the exercise, you know, and, what the lung findings do in comparison to the filling pressures. Would you get both? Uh, would, you know, if you were to stick one right after the exercise, you know, how would you see that being applicable? Yeah, the, the question was uh, using uh, E over E prime and lung ultrasound during exercise for filling pressures. So, um, yeah, so the diastolic stress test is something that was like a, uh, something we did all the time in Mayo and it was JO's thing. And we use the uh, medial uh, E prime and then the E wave, and we use greater than 13 or 14 or so. It can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the reason of looking at lung ultrasound is that lung ultrasound is, is much more feasible. You can get it in almost everyone. 
And so the idea was to compare those two. If there, if there are actual signs that the filling pressures go up, do we see the change with lung? And that was why we wanted Dr. Borlaug to help us because that is the gold standard. He has a catheter in the, in the patient and he can tell us what happens with the, the pressures. Um, uh, so the way it works is that diastolic uh, component of the stress test has to be done really quickly, right? So you do the walls first, then you do TR, then you do the diastology. Beelines last for, for minutes. So you can do the entire test and the beelines will be there five minutes afterwards. That's what we found. So it just makes it a little easier. It just, it's, uh, and it's pretty quick. So it's a quick way to look at things and you don't have as much of a time crunch to be able to get everything done. Do you think four zones, two in each side or, or three in each? I mean, that's what's been shown. Um, I think that the more, I think sometimes we want, I always want to do more zones, like look at all the lungs and that can confuse you a little bit if you're just spending so much time. What I found is um, you see the most beelines in the, um, in the axillary space. So that's really sensitive and maybe a little less specific. If you see beelines anteriorly and the patient is supine, then that's, that's a real finding. That's a little less sensitive, but very specific. A couple of online questions. Um, so the first of which, uh, are there false positive beelines on lung echo? Uh, false positive. Yeah, okay, so I, the false positive beelines, I guess the way to think about that is, can you see beelines with a normal lung? And the answer is yes, uh, you can. The, uh, the, the difference between normal and abnormal is the number of beelines that you see. So in one intercostal space, if you see an isolated beeline, that can be a normal finding. It's when you start to see multiple beelines, and usually what the literature says is three or more, then that becomes an area of the lung that has increased lung density that's abnormal. You can also, it's very normal at, like I said, the more dependent you get in the lungs, the more likely you are to see the lungs uh, a little bit of atelectasis in just a normal lung, and that will cause some beelines as well. But it's the number that tells you something and the pattern. One thing that I remember from my internal medicine training, we did a lot of bedside ultrasound, is that you can't have a fake out in that a fibrotic lung or an emphysematous lung can have a lot of beelines, but there's not necessarily a lot of fluid there. So integrating the IVC as well can be another marker to show that this actually is, is volume and fluid overload rather than just poor lung. Yeah, and it's a really great point. Again, beelines just tell you something about the parenchyma and, and the density, right? And so with the fibrotic lung, it's the same thing. The density has changed, and so you'll see some beelines. So you do have to put it together with the, the clinical picture. So oh, the case example which you showed, uh, just to take that as an example, how does this B lines correlate with the treatment? For example, if that patient had undergone mitral valve replacement, the rheumatic, and you had done the test three months later or six months later, what would does will it correlate with loss of B lines? And has there been a validation of how B lines correlate? It's really amazing. The last time I gave this talk, Dr. Crestinello asked the exact same question to me. Um, and it was a patient that he operated on. So uh, that's the funny point. He doesn't know that. Um, no, I mean, we didn't, we hadn't had the chance to look at that yet. Uh, I think it'd be, these are all the places, if you think about this and you think about the potential of this uh, diagnostic modality, you can apply it in a lot of different ways, right? You could look at patients with prosthetic valves and see, you know, I, I don't know the answer. You know, we don't exercise a lot of those patients. So it'd be really interesting to see. Absolutely. Just a couple more online questions, two more here. Uh, Dr. Gessel asks, can you bill for your exam? That's a great question. Uh, so billing for the exam. Also a question I get every time I, I give this talk. Um, you can bill for this exam. Um, you can bill, uh, there are different ways to do it, but you can, depending on what you do, um, I know that the, probably a better person to talk to if you have that question would be talk to Dave Tierney about it. He's really the, um, the, the leader of, of, of bedside ultrasound here at Alina and one of the leaders nationally. Um, but it is something that, that you can bill for. It's billed separately from echocardiography. Um, I don't bill it because I use it as part of my exam on patients, but you, but you can do it. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, the last online question comes from Dr. Hauser, who asks, uh, can you talk about the use of point of care ultrasound outside of the ICU, for example, uh, in the clinic or just routine use? Uh, 
Yeah, so long ultrasound outside of the ICU routine use. Well, that, that I think is the looking at patients with heart failure. Uh, and, I, and that slide I showed where uh, you can use it in, in clinic. So this is, doesn't just have to be a heart failure clinic, but any patient you're taking care of that, that has chronic heart failure. And using it when you see them, each time you see them, uh, to gauge what you think um, they're, if they're congested or not. Because these patients are walking around, a lot of them, with subclinical congestion. So you can use it in patients uh, who you're seeing um, in clinic who, who have heart failure, I think is a, is a great place to do it. That, I think, is where I see the most benefit and where it's been looked at, at the most. Um, it's, I'm not a pulmonologist, but they've been looking at lung ultrasound, and definitely at Mayo, they're looking at it in patients with fibrotic lung disease, with interstitial lung disease. And that study that I did where I looked at elastography, I you know, came into contact with the, with the bioengineer that was doing that study because he had already done a study in patients with, um, with uh, uh, interstitial lung disease. And we were looking at ways that you can use both lung ultrasound and surface wave elastography to look at the stiffness of lungs and look at how lung stiffness changes over time. So there are a lot of different ways to, uh, to incorporate it. Um, I like to think about patients that, uh, where the uh, intracardiac hemodynamics are important. And so I think about heart failure patients. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.